three, two, one, recording. Okay. All right. Welcome to a mini clinic sponsored by the New Jersey Wood Turners. We have a total of five clubs here tonight, including the Hudson Valley Wood Turners, the Atlantic Shore Wood Turners, the Bucks Wood Turners, and the Water Gap Wood Turners. And tonight's presentation is going to be done by Dennis Weiner and showing us how he uses aluminum extrusions in his wood, wood turning shop. So take it away, Dennis. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for allowing me to share my wood turning journeys with all you guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, a retired IT consultant. And I'm going to pause because I'm just getting used to this slideshow. And my journey in wood turning began about 1993, 27 years ago as a hobbyist. I'm mostly self taught in wood turning and in shop innovations. I especially like turning hollow forms and classical shapes. I have a passion for problem solving, usually resulting in wood turning gadgets and gizmos. My early influences in wood turning were David Ellsworth, Richard Raffin, and Frank Sudol. Uh, I got a disclosure, I, I don't sell my work and I don't sell any tools and I'm not gonna sell you anything tonight. Um, also, I'm not a machinist or a metal worker. All wood turning accessories that I will present tonight will be made using simple tools that are typically found in a wood shop, such as a table saw, chop saw, drill press, router, of course, wood lathe. I feel if you can cut and drill wood, then you can do the same with aluminum. But as a safety reminder, I just have to tell you, when cutting aluminum and aluminum extrusions, please use the appropriate blade for non-ferrous metals and always use proper protective equipment. So, the session goals today, I'm going to illustrate how aluminum extrusions can be integrated in creating accessories and jigs in the wood turning workshop. I will re review the storyboarding process as used in wood turning to better understand the first accessory, my laser storyboard. I will walk through turning process of a traditional storyboard example that uses caliper and depth cuts and then walk you through two turnings using the laser storyboard. And then I'll turn around and discuss the components and construction of that laser storyboard. And I'll show you a couple accessories using a V block centering drilling aid. I'll review my new grinder that has an Ellsworth jig and a batty style jig, and it was made all from aluminum extrusions. And the uh, that would be on a tradesman. And then I'll review the previous grinder that I had. Um, I call it my legacy belt sander, where I developed everything for it from a $50 belt sander. I was able to do marvelous things. But the overall goal is that you're introduced today to aluminum extrusions and see its potential in the wood turning workshop. So, what is an extrusion? In case you don't know, my definition is it's any product that's produced as a result of passing raw material through a die to create an elongated profile of that die, like uh, yesterday's dinner. <laughs> so here's some examples of some extrusions that you may have in your shop or your household. I'm just showing you demonstrating some of these, not demonstrating, I'm illustrating some of them, see how commonplace they really are. So being the table saw, bandsaw fence, etc., so forth, will be in window frames, door frames, showers, many use um, AEs for uh, slides and different things. And I thank Rockler for their uh, contribution in their pictures. But Close to our hearts is this very popular MITRE T-slot, which is also, the heart of it is an aluminum extrusion, sorry. But close to our stomachs is barbecue. 
and close to my heart and stomach is this invention called drill grates that, may, that are made also of aluminum extrusions. And that's around my house. The bottom left picture shows use without drill grates, whereas the uh, right side shows with it. And you see the flare-ups, and this doesn't do flare-ups. So anyway, let me get back on topic. These are the two sizes shown of the aluminum extrusion that I will choose for my projects. These are called V-slot rails. They're from a company called openbuilds.com. And one is 20 by 20 millimeters and the other is 20 by 60 millimeters. These are ideal for structural components. They accept T-nuts on all four sides and provide super design flexibility. And they have a couple other sizes. They definitely do. Um, my first AE accessory that I will fabricate involves the process of storyboarding. Well, what is storyboarding boarding in terms of wood turning? As most of you know, the traditional way a wood turn object can be copied is to draw or obtain a life-size model drawing and or a create a plywood pattern of that object. The dimensions are copied from the model to the storyboard using calipers at various points and transferred to the workpiece, marking depths using a parting tool, usually in spindle turning. I will be referring to the process as applying to copying forms, not spindle turning detail. Uh, David Ellsworth taught, taught me and trained me to rely on my eye for most of the form, forming of most shapes. I usually did my work free form until one day I had to create an oversized 24 inch pepper mill for a friend. To turn the pepper mill, I used a traditional storyboard method. I measured and marked and parted in every inch and then turned the curve based on my depth marks. So, I'm not proud of these, but I took them out of the archive. Here are three life-size drawings we used, and we selected the second of the third to do the uh, pepper mill. So the blank was walnut, and using walnut, a billet like this, you're a little concerned because it costs a lot of money. <laughs> so. The bottom selection section was drilled and the depth was marked on the blank every inch for convenience as previously stated. In the next slide, oops, sorry. In the next slide, both bottom and top were combined and turned to finish off the piece. And that was the result of the storyboarding. I didn't chance creating this one-of-a-kind item freehand. The storyboard method ensured fairly accurate rendition of the drawing. The long and gradual curve was too challenging for me, at least. The manual storyboard method was a good assist. And uh, please note the chuck jaws. They're custom made, and we'll see more of them later. Oh, by the way, here's the finished pepper mill. Mahoney is right there, the walnut. That's pretty. Over the years, I made many pieces using storyboarding. Since I love to do classical forms, I found a source that had quite a few illustrations that I found very pleasing. This book has grid lines, which are perfect for storyboarding. And let me just turn my pointer on. For many years, I made beautiful forms using this method, but eventually I found storyboard, storyboarding extremely tedious. This is, the, this is the other piece, by the way, that we're gonna do. That one and this one. And here's a picture of my layouts. And uh, I found, eventually I found this extremely tedious uh, to do. Too much measuring, parting, etc. 
you're supposed to be having fun and not doing all this mathematics and all this stuff. So one day when I was using my laser hollowing system by association, I thought of a solution to end all measuring, calculating and parting. I thought if you could mark a reasonable amount of laser points on a graphic presentation of the piece, I could turn it to get near that shape. I initially thought that the cost of this continuous type of laser system was too expensive. Like most, I followed and bought from the wood turning vendor crowd. They all use those inconvenient push button laser pointers. I used to buy replacements for 30 bucks from Jameson. If I used, if I used that, if I used 12 points, it would cost me $360 to make this thing just by the lasers alone. So right after I had all these thoughts, ironically, my uh, hollowing system laser went out and I had to search Amazon to replace it. And I found this replacement and I found this, something similar to this ad. Mine was four years ago, but mine said buy 10 lasers for $2.28. So that's like, oh boy, man. 23 cents each. I kind of got suckered right into this, you know, you think? Like a vortex. So I ordered it and the fun began. And I found out that only six of the 10 China lasers fired at the, at the same intensity. So I ordered 20 more, figuring I'll get 12 good ones with some spares. And for framework, I considered quite a few designs using wood, such as uh, wood as frame. And the cost of using wood with, say, T-tracks wasn't that much more expensive or cheaper than using just plain aluminum extrusions. So I finalized on open bills V-slot rails for the frame with the 12, with 12 laser arms for design. AE, aluminum extrusions, provide the best flexibility in framework design and ease of laser alignment and adjustment. So I'm really excited to show you how all this works and then we'll come back and we'll return to detail of construction. Okay, so how does this thing work? Well, just looking at the picture, you're getting an idea. So the first thing we start out, that I started out with is a three quarter inch uh, melamine board. Actually, this is a formica board. And it's placed between, between centers supported by the tool rest. The tool rest was adjusted so that the board is level from the tool rest towards the center. There is a line drawn that marks the lathe in the center line. A drawing or photo of a life-size object that you wish to turn should have a center line marked and be placed on the board. Uh, and it's got to be lined up. The drawing center line has to be lined up to the storyboard center line, and then you just tape it down. Well, taking a look at this. It's pretty impressive, but where are those lasers firing from? The left side, the left photo, left side shows a 1500 millimeter or just less than five feet overhead cross support, which is secured to the ceiling above the lathe. Lengthwise, it runs level and perpendicular to the lathe bed. The right photo is, a, is the laser arm assembly. And we'll see more of that later. This is graphical rendition of what all this looks like. The left side is a sample laser before turning. And obviously, the circle is the turning piece. And it's pointing towards someplace out here. And it picked that up from a setting that we used when we put the melamine board right on center. 
the right side is turned and it's reaching its goal. The laser line is approaching a tangent to the work and appears to be falling off the piece. If the laser line fell off the piece, you cut too far. Note, the laser, the laser arm and the cross support are level. And I have to look at, I'm a little behind on looking at one computer to the other, so forgive me on that. So let's prove that this works. We'll put on some wood. Now let's see what happens. Oh, that's me. And I got a nice big chunk of cherry log from uh, cherry from this log for this project. So ready to put it on the lathe about seven months later. And there it is on the left on the lathe, and I find it much easier on my back here to uh, prop it up. I'm using two six by sixes and a three quarter storyboard to bring it up to center on my 24 inch swing one way. The right side reveals a crack after I've turned it down. I originally was gonna make the piece, make the top from one piece and I lucked out and I just got enough length out of it to pull it off and just the top will be made from another piece from another part of that log. So, using my big Vic Mark and large dovetail drawers, my first piece is ready for turning. I decided to part in until the dots start showing and turn a little elongated into small, to, uh, to dashes. And I just can't get away from those old habits. They die hard of using the parting tool, but it was the first time. Now I just use my tools and, and work to the line. Don't bother parting. Woo! It's working. And the lines drop towards the center and they're elongated so I know that I need it, met it and the shape is being met. So I, at this point, I'm like, crazy crazy happy because putting all this together was months work and it was like terrific so i took some pictures and i laid on my back on the lathe and in the shavings and took a picture the left one took a picture looking upward and see all my laser arms pointing and hitting i envisioned uh you know a title on there woodworking journal but thought thought about that and said forget it the right side is like looking down so what slide am i up to so we jump ahead and with hollowing complete i'm ready to part it off and here's the piece starting to shape up looking good got it off the lathe and it's pretty close to uh, the, uh, the original. Not exactly. Um, the lid, that I found a, the taller lid disturbing, so I modified it. And this, this piece was for my son, so I can get away with anything. And there I am again, another look at this, seeing that everything is matching up. And this is the finished piece. And I flocked the inside. And somebody's going to ask me, what would you finish it with? Well, I finished it with water-based polyurethane. It was diluted 50 to 50. I rubbed it on, rubbed it off, rubbed it on, rubbed it off. And then I used the Beal system to uh, finish it off. This is the second piece. Dennis, was your son planning to put anybody in there? Well... Yeah, I, you know, the whole thing was a little crazy because I made him like three bowls. He kept asking me for a bowl with a lid, a bowl. He didn't like any of them. So I gave him the book. I said, have fun, go find something you like. And he picked this out. And that's how basically this all got started. So this is the other piece that I was looking at that I, I kind of liked and 
if you look at all the boxes, it measures to uh, I don't know, 22 inches if one square equals one inch. So I'm planning to make a big one, but I had this uh, beautiful wood laying around. So I scaled this down and I went to town. But this piece is a, was a little different in that technically, uh, how was I gonna do that? The boring ball, well, this piece was hollowed from the bottom and it was plugged. If I hollowed it from the top where there wouldn't be enough room for the boring bar to reach all parts of the form. So if you hollow it from the bottom, you can reach a good size of it and drill off from the top. Also, the outside would leave, you know, the piece unstable if you hollowed it from the top up. And that was a problem. So, my solution was that the piece can be shaped and hollowed in three or four steps to maintain its structural integrity. So I did it. I did that also without a steady rest. So basically I put the piece on a hollow part of the piece and I'm sorry, I turned part of the piece, the outside and did a little bit of the inside, a little bit more of the outside, a little bit of the inside and that way it got the weight off the piece so my conclusion about that is that having the design storyboard laser was i'm sorry laser storyboarding makes it easier to do this and just in general laser storyboard is going to expand my shape selection to include exciting form designs that i never even considered so so Dennis? Yeah. Are you gonna show how the lasers are held in place? Absolutely, later on. Yeah, we're saving that to the end. That's the part I'm anxious to see. I'll show you that, guaranteed. Okay, thanks. But I gotta to torture you first. All right. Um, this piece is on a face plate with three inch leg bolts holding it. It's drilled first through the bottom and the tent is created to hold it on the reverse side. The face plate is marked. Let me go to the next one. So the face plate came off and it's marked and temporarily removed and remaining coring pilot hole is drilled, meeting the hole drilled from the other side. The steady is used uh, for this operation and the face plate is then reinstalled with the aid of a live center to uh, for a spindle back uh, adapter to keep things aligned. Um, then I put back the face plate and this time I put all the three screw three inch screws in there to hold it. So on the left you see that the piece is progressing and where am I? I'm sorry. The piece is being held from the top of the face plate, a tannin for holding the piece when the top needs to be finished is cut and partial shape and hollowing process is proceeding. And that's on the left. And you can see that I made the plug and I made this tenon for the next chuck. Then you see the piece is proceeding and I don't know, we're about up to here and put the other chuck on. Then I had to use this to clean out the hole and do, you know, finish the rest of the piece. So that's it. And there's the bottom of it. So this concludes how we use the story laser board. So the next is we go, we're going into uh, construction. But first, I'm going to tell you the advantages of aluminum extrusions if you didn't know it. They're very strong, lightweight, flexible, construction joints, almost as strong as a well, doesn't require finishing. And I chose basically because of the modular design capability and also to be able to tighten and loosen the laser arms very easily. Um, and the accuracy, the ease of breakdown, assembly and storage. 
and the ability, of course, to expand it. But later on, you're going to see the huge flexibility options when protocoling a model and using uh, these extrusions. Now, I'd advise everybody to go to openbuilds.com and just look around. You might get lost in there. Um, there's a forum. There's projects. Um, basically, there's a competitor. Four years ago, there was a competitor. Now there's more competitors. I won't talk about it. But Open Builds designed for is you know designed for linear motion. Although my usage has been uh, structurally related only. The linear rail again is called V slot, and basically this vendor caters to the inventors market. Everybody else is probably catering to the manufacturers. But when you go to this site, you'll see 3D printers, CNC routers, laser cutters, plasma cutters, plotters, draw bath, but Bob, camera slides. The track on here is wonderful and made for camera slides. If you see that this is a cross section and this is a, a bearing wheel and you see how that fits in there snugly when you make a carriage, this holds its weight and they use it for routers and CNC routers and all that other stuff. So these are the parts used that I, to fabricate. I mean, some of the parts that I use to fabricate the labor laser storyboard on the bottom is a 20 by 60 extrusion. And this other piece as well is a sample piece. This is a 20 by 20 and 20 by 20 as well. And these are hidden corner brackets and you'll see them in action, how they take the pieces and put them together. The hardest system is these little T-nuts and they're five millimeter. Most of the system is five millimeter. These are some screws that I use. They're also five millimeter and the eight on there indicates that they're eight inches long. I mean, sorry, eight millimeters long. Over here are some aluminum, I don't know what you call them, molding strips. They're an eighth of an inch by three quarters wide. I used, I don't know how many, two eight footers or so, maybe more. And these are uh, one inch ball bearings. We got lasers, wires, more lasers. You got a terminal to, connect up everything in a terminal jumper. Back down here, this little piece is a two and a half by two and a half L bracket aluminum. It's a quarter inch. I used it and you'll see the way I used it. And there's just another screw. That's a cap screw. So let me see where I'm, what slide I'm up to. I'm sorry. I'm up to slide 47. Right, the horizontal, this is the horizontal, we're getting into the construction now, discussion on discussion. The horizontal support allows the 12 lasers to be positioned and adjusted and moved to any position along the beam's five foot length. The support runs parallel to the lathe and is supported at the ceiling. Originally, the horizontal track was supported on the lathe bed, which I found too inconvenient. The, horrible, the horizontal V slot rail is drilled every inch to secure laser arm assemblies with flat screws and wing nuts. And you can see the wing nuts uh, over there. The laser, yeah. The laser arms bottom T-slot accepts the flat screw and it slides and adjusts to uh, desire position, whatever you want in and out, side to side to uh, coordinate uh, the laser firing. Uh, I got a little clip coming up and it uses a small piece uh, to represent this whole entire uh, five foot long length B slot and a little demonstration on how um, the laser arm will fit in and how you'll adjust it. And this is my first video that I ever edited. Welcome to Dennis's workshop. Where'd you get that line? What line? <laughs> Dennis's workshop. See that slides right in and you tighten it up and you're good to go. Put it wherever you want it. Directed by DW. How was that? So we got the horizontal rail and you see how um, those pieces go on. 
you didn't see how I constructed it. That's later. Um, now we'll talk about the vertical supports and how I did that. I have a, I have a clip that shows that. It connects uh, the vertical to the horizontal V-slot extrusion. The installation uses four inside, right in here, inside corner brackets, the vertical support. The custom ceiling um, is that aluminum brackets that, that I cut from that piece. And they were drilled out in my wood shop. They connect to the ceiling via lag bolts and connect to the vertical V-slot via um, three T-nuts on each side, three bolts, three T-nuts. Holds it, it's unbelievable. And this shows me installing that. I didn't lock it down, I didn't set screw them down, and you need two more of them. But basically, that's how it sits. And if you want to come over and do some chin ups on that, you can because it ain't going anywhere. It's like crazy. Dennis? Yeah. Was this the first time you would use aluminum extrusions or did you have other previous experience with these things? Uh, in my lifetime, I never used it. I, I had a client that um, was a manufacturer of um, windows and uh, storefronts. So I got to see them you know, from a platform cutting up all this stuff. And I knew, you know, it was kind of whatever. Okay. Uh, it's funny how I, I got to it because I was interested. I was doing um, a sphere jig. And I had some linear bearings that a good friend of mine who might be in the audience, Len Felberg, he gave, gave me some three-quarter linear bearings he wasn't using. And I made a sled for it and everything. And I was really interested in linear motion, how it would work. And, I, you know, I made this sphere, sphere jig um, advancing, et cetera, so forth. And it made me look on the Internet all over the place. And eventually, when, you know, I typed in linear motion, eventually it led me to open builds. And that w it was all over there. And I was at that site for a long time with other interests. So I just got there. And I hope, given it to you guys, maybe one or two of you guys will get interested in the stuff. But uh, through, it, this is used throughout industry. It's crazy good. So this is the laser arm assembly, adjustment, et cetera, so forth is, is here. Um, you might ask, well, what the hell is all this crap? Well, there's probably a story behind everything, but here are the two stories. When I got all the lasers, the second and third shipment, I was like laying them out on the table. And I go, how the hell is this going to work? I thought, you know, I had ordered the aluminum extrusions already. I thought I was just going to drill a hole about here and stick a laser in it and, and adjust it. But my problem was that the lasers don't fire parallel to their case. So some of them might, some of them will go off a little bit. And, you know, it was like totally inconsistent. Uh, then again, what do you want for 23 cents a piece, right? So I went to make it work. And I figured the way it would work is if I had some kind of uh, ball type assembly where I can adjust it 360 degrees to get it to go straight down where I wanted it to go. I want these to go plumb. So I got some ball bearings and I found out that, oh, I can't drill ball bearings. So I called up uh, the company, I think it was uh, Speedy or, or one of those online metals and told them, I said, I thought this was machinable, whatever. And they said to me, you know what? Cost too much to return them, keep them. I said, all right. So then I went to another uh, metal place. And I think it was MSC and I bought a bag of uh, one inch bearings and they had told me that it's drillable. It's 1018 soft steel. You should be able to drill it. Well, that came there and uh, that didn't work either. I called them up when they gave me my money back also and said, keep them. 
So I lucked out there, but I didn't know what to do and I did some reading and I said, oh, they gotta be annealed and they'll make them soft. Well, you see they're black and I have those grill with the grill grates on it and I have an infrared burner. So I turned it on with one and uh, I left it on all night and I let it cool down and took a file and saw that it is now machinable. So, so there, so that's all the uh, trials and tribulations that I went through. So the whole idea here is that this be adjustable and this being 20 millimeters, which is 0.79 of an inch, the one inch is greater. And if I hold this and kind of squeeze it, it'll hold, especially with the screws and the T-nuts, it'll really hold it. And you loosen it up, you can rotate it and move it around. So this is basically, this assembly uh, was made. And then I realized after that I screwed up because I was one inch and now with this one eighth and one eighth plus 0.79, I was just over an inch. So what I did was I took these and I staggered them somewhat up, some face down and some face up. So I was able to still keep to my one inch. Thank goodness, right? So this is how I assembled it. This is an example of how I extended the. Uh, so Dennis, this is your first experiment on holding the lasers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now this was, so version one that you came out with other versions after this? No. No, you, this is what the current? Usually I do a project and if it's working, uh, I end, you know, I'll try to end the project already. It's enough of this crap. Okay. Um, I found better bolts uh, other than those round ones, but I didn't buy them yet. So that I don't, when I put the laser on, I push it up, they're round bolts, they go in perfect, but you have to hold the laser de those bolts down, otherwise they rotate. If you have a, like a hex bolt uh, shape, you know, it's a T-nut concept, you just slide it in and, you know, turn the screw and it won't turn. So, everybody see that? I guess so. So now, this little shot is to show you that, yes, the top is level. So the theory is if the top is level and the arm is level and I could plumb down, then I got a perfect square coming down. And being that the storyboard was level, because I told you that I leveled it. I got a nice box and the laser light is gonna be tangential off the wood when you're getting near um, the mark that you need to. And on the left, uh, this little box, this was an add-on later. Um, it's like a dimmer. All the lasers are in parallel and they're run by a uh, five bolt little power supply that I ripped off from something. I don't know what. Maybe a, a, an adapter charger or something that was five volts. So I wanted you to see this to keep in mind what we were aiming for in the next slide. In the next slide, we're gonna we're gonna adjust the laser. And I invented this crap too. So this picture, you can see that I have a vertical support. And uh, it was an early picture when I had the vertical support. And having this vertical support and changing it gave me a lot of materials for the rest of the video, extra projects. But I want you to look here. There's something that you didn't see. There's an L bracket. And it's a triple L bracket. It has screws and it holds it, holds these pieces together, but not as strong as the hidden uh, nuts. I put a plate up here and drilled it in to support this fishing line, monofilament. Thanks for donating it, Bob. Um, I loosened these up a little bit and I put the cord, dangled the cord and there's a plumb on the bottom of it so that the laser line, the laser would light up the knot and then hopefully if it was on target, 
the laser would travel through the monofilament and you'd see the monofilament getting red. But better than that is that you see the laser on the top of the plumb bone. So I got a video of that. So let's watch that. So there's the, the alignment and you can see little tints of red in there on the monofilament and it's moving and we got plum. You're not going to get better than that. And if you can see also in this video on the left is my assembly line of stuff that, you know, get the arms. You could tell that when I got this done, I had to take a video because I was so impressed with myself. But anyway, there's the, um, that bracket again, that's holding this got wood screw. I got a wood interface now wood screws and the bracket has the T nuts. This to give it more support is, I don't know what kind of wood that is, but I drilled three holes in it and I put T nuts right through and it held very well. And that is the heart of the system. Now you know why it works. Because you don't have to really align these things very much. Um, I have not seen one of them go off unless it fell on the floor or whatever. And it's been about three, four years. And that's the same one. So in production, I told you, I reminded you about those jaws. These are the one-way flat jaws. They're probably one of the most versatile jaws out there. They're one of my favorites, even though I don't like, I use the Vicmark chuck. I don't use the one way as much, but this was absolutely great. So I had 24 of these arms to make. And because we had a hole in these, I put a little clamp, I held a piece, that's a stop lock. So I open it up and drill. Get the next one, open it up, drill, open it up, drill, and drill, and drill, and open, and et cetera, so forth. And you could tell it's part of um, the back, uh, I forgot what you call that, the, to support a drill cut underneath. But anyway, this is supporting that and supporting the, I don't know, that clamp, which was probably made out of a, a microphone clip or something. but very these these chop, uh, these jaws are extremely versatile and i think uh the hat maker johannesson also had said that so 41 bucks i think you should have it if you have a one-way chuck you should have these jaws because Dennis. you never know when you're going to need to uh to Dennis. make something yeah um, what piece are you making now what are all these little pieces for those are the laser arms. Okay. We, we uh, backtrack a little bit. These, I'm making these. Okay. So I, need, yeah. I need 24 of them. And these, these happen to be extras. And uh, this one has a T-net on. I have, I have, one of them has a bigger hole that I put over here to hold the monofilament. So let's move on. And oops, that is um, another way that I use these chucks. Is I had a I had these uh, ball bearings that I had to drill uh, two holes in each of them. One of the holes was six millimeter hole for the laser and then another hole that assists me in uh, adjusting it by sticking an allen wrench through it so drilling out this way was convenient because it's self-centering and i had no setup so much better than using a drill press um but putting it in was a little tricky so i would draw a line on the circumference and just below the circumference line, I would start tightening the draw, the jaws so that the uh, the round sphere was pushing into the jaws as well as being held by them. Um, this was really a great thing. 
and don't forget to protect your eyes. So I thought, these are uh, special laser shield glasses to protect you. The lasers that I'm using are extremely low power. However, I did notice they reflect and they would get a little bit of a glare. So like a fool, I went out and I spent almost $100 on these laser shields. They're specifically manufactured for a certain frequency. So if you have a blue laser, these are no good. Um, different wavelengths, no good. The thing about these lasers, these uh, glasses, are they were too good. I would put them on, I wouldn't see the laser lights. <laughs> so I threw out $100. <laughs> the whole purpose was to see the laser lights. Unmute yourself and laugh. Go ahead. All right. We're moving along here. I'm going to take a drink of water. Give me a second. Okay, I'm going to talk about the second accessory. Hold on, Dennis. Dennis, Dennis, hold on. So where's the picture of the lasers mounted directly above the vase or the turning that you've got? Um, and, and I assume they're all adjustable to various projects, right? Oh, yeah. You just put it down. You open it with a wing nut and you slide it in or out. If you have a pattern that's 12 inches, use the first 12. If you have something that's uh, 24 inches, uh, move the lasers around, space them out to every two inches. Do you have a photo of, of that? Because I saw something earlier, it looked like you had uh, PVC white sticks also holding the lasers. White, I'm not following you. I saw something earlier you had, it looked like uh, straws uh, from above and not these, uh, these laser arms that you have. Oh, that picture was showing the laser arms. I was laying flat on the floor looking up and the laser arms were attached to the main horizontal cross beam by those wing nuts. They weren't moving. Why don't you go back to the picture? I'm sorry? I said, why don't you go back to the picture of it? All right. So let me just mark down where I am. I'm on slide 62, and let's go see if I can find that somewhere. There. You, you just passed it. On the left? No, he's saying on the right, but that's just the glare making it look white. Oh, this? Right. Yeah, the white sticks this, on the on the right. The white sticks are the same sticks that were that I manufactured. That has the the one hole, the round hole that holds the laser. It's uh, not. Oh, it's oh, aluminum. Oh, it's a, oh, okay. I'm with you now. I understand. It's, okay. it's aluminum. The, the glare makes it look white, but you can right. see the black is the wall. Yeah. With the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Black. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. And okay. the, the ones on the left, just they, they uh, are adjustable back and forth. Well, it's the same thing. It's just that you're, here you see the horizontal track. You see the holes. Well, those were, you know, the one inch apart holes that I drilled. And I'm, I'm using this one. I'm using this one. I'm using this one and this one and this one. But I'm not using that one, et cetera, so forth. I have, you know, it's spaced out in between two. I don't know if this laser is firing about here, but. Yeah, that's you on your back looking up at, at uh, what's showing the pattern that's uh, projecting the pattern down onto your piece. Yeah. I was kind of like, you know, the people lay in the snow and uh, they move their arms and legs and make it. I was doing that in shavings as I was taking this picture. I was so happy that it was working. 
But anyway, any other questions on this? Yeah, the other question I had was why, <laughs> I'm sorry, but why uh, does do these need to be rotating at an angle or anything? Why can't they just be a straight shot and not have to swivel around inside those brackets? What do you mean here? No, um, no, the, the, the balls that are holding no, no, the with the balls. Why are you using the balls? The ball needs to swivel because the laser, the cheap lasers are not straight. So you can't go by the case of the laser. They shoot out on an angle. So that was the I want yeah, I want the lasers going down. I want the lasers going down perpendicular to the board. They gotta be square. The beam, just picture it as a as a line, has to be square to those dots. And uh, horizontal has to be. Somebody's got Somebody's got to be muted. The, the laser could be crooked enough that at the distance it's going, it could be off a, a few inches, actually. Well, it's, it, they were aligned to be plumbed down past that. Now, what Jeff is saying that is that by buying the cheaper lasers, you weren't getting ones that were necessarily shooting straight. So you needed to come up with a way of being able to adjust them to compensate for that. And that's why you use the, uh, the, the steel balls. That's right? correct. Right. Um, but even the lasers that I would get from Jameson or any of the other people, they didn't fire straight either. You thought they did, but you know, they were straight enough that you didn't go through the wall, let's put it this way. And often when you're using the lasers uh, in the hollowing situation, you have to kind of take the that. system, the laser is quite a bit closer to the work, so it's not as much error. Uh, yeah, well, this is not much more. This is, uh, oh, it's not on the ceiling. It's, I could reach these, so. Maybe it's six feet. Oh, but you're, you're setting the laser, when you're talking like Jameson, or my car, the hollowing system, you're setting the laser to the distance from the cutting tool, right to the right. cutting tool. In this case, you're not, you don't have that point of reference. You well, have, I, you've, you the have point of reference is, uh, Len, the point of reference is center line of the lathe. That's where the center line is. That's the same reference point as the cutter. It's the center. We set these up, the lasers up on the center. So the beam and that center, again, repeating, was level. But then, then it's one question. If you set it up on a center line, then why is it a problem if the original beam from the from the laser is shifted and it's not perpendicular totally because your reference point is on the center line so you will not lose much if you leave them directly into the you know going down in well, the, the, the balls well it will bother you if you you'll understand it if you take 12 of these in a row and you line it up and they're an inch apart and these are actually, like I said, 0.79 inches apart. Um, you know, the arms. And the holes are one inch. So if I set up a grid and put back, let me just show you this. I don't know where it is, but, oh, perfect. So, if I set up a grid and I say, well, I want this, 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 all, all of these to have a dot across this grid. And my arm, technically upstairs, I can have one arm being almost an inch and say this is one inch. I can set this up. If you have the lasers going crooked, the one that's supposed to be over here is over here. And the one over here is over there. So that's why 
they have to be perfectly square, so to speak, with this um, this platform for it to work. That's why I set it up as a plumb, as a plumb bomb, so that the lasers would adjust straight down. And you only have to set it once. On That's the it. Setup. Unless they, you know, tend to go bad. And I wouldn't doubt that, but that's that's the the math of it and the science of it. So, Dennis, could you just uh, duplicate that grid pattern on a piece of plywood, drill the holes for the lasers, insert the lasers in the plywood, and just have it directly above the um, the, the workpiece? Well, if they're firing in different positions, if you use the drill press and, and drill 12 six millimeter holes and you stick 12 lasers in, they're not gonna follow the grid because they're all off. You'll have some, oops, sorry. You'll have some that are here, you'll have some that are here. You'll, it'll be all over the place, it won't be fun. You That's what I was- You need a way of, of aiming them, don't you? I'm sorry? Then right. you really need a way of aiming them to compensate for the fact that they're not uniform. Yeah, well, that's why I made the ball and, and the uh, whole okay. invention was so to get them. Now that you're using them, do you see that those like off, uh, you know, those dis not discrepancies, but that uh, the laser is actually shooting that much off because by the way you're saying it, the laser can, can shoot like three inches off from its uh, perpendicular position. So. Are they that bad? I mean, it's I. I know that you know distance is not that big that you you know you're shooting from. So having that uh, laser missing the point for three inches because it's not shooting straight down, it's kind of like. I mean, it's. I'm not sure. I haven't used. Well, it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm giving an example. Any variance here is just totally annoying because you can't use the system if you have. 12 lasers and only 12 inches and they're not exactly where they're supposed to be you're not going you're going to have trouble adjusting it especially if if one is over here you won't be able to move this arm because it'll hit this the other laser mm -hmm. physically they got to be able to just come straight out Take uh, the, that's the hollowing system and just rotate the laser around and it'll, a good one will scribe a circle. Well, okay. find me a good one. That's the, that's the issue. It'll still be a circle. Look, um, bad one, they, they sell them, they sell them for $3, the they sell them for $5 and they sell them for more. So it's the laser beam by its nature is straight, is going to fire straight. But from the casing is where the problem is. Where is that diode when they manufactured it and moved over a little bit? It's going to fire. I don't know what line it's going to fire. That's what I found. That so, makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry? That, that makes a lot of sense. It's only as good as what's holding it. So I think they're just like glued in the end, right? They just slap them in. They slap them in, and some of them, uh, they have lenses, but some of them, the lenses work, and some of them, they don't work. So what do you want for, uh, you know, 23 cents here? Yeah. See this one? This one is losing its intensity. So that's why I have spares. Okay, but let's just for a minute go back to here. and. I don't know, it's hard for me to do this because I have some crap over here that I'm not seeing. I'm just moving some stuff around so that I can point properly. This little guy is perpendicular to the board that I had in there. Okay, are we in agreement to that? Yeah. I want this laser to fire at 90 degrees to that board and 90 degrees to this platform 
If I do that, I have the light going straight down to where its target is, which is right over here at center line, where the board originally, where we set up the laser. And that was the challenge of this whole thing. So that's what I'm trying to tell you is the casing, the case goes one way into the hole, it secures it, but the laser is firing differently. It's not necessarily firing parallel to the case. And maybe that is what I didn't explain and where the confusion is. So you did experiment with different lasers between three cent lasers and $5 lasers? No. I got these lasers and I went with it, you know? Okay. I wanted to, I wanted to give, uh, what's his name, uh, a 23 cent laser so he doesn't go over the $10 budget of the uh, hollowing system. No, I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Okay. But the quality of the lasers for $5, $10, $20, same crap. The diode lasers and uh, they're knocking them out. So, okay, I understand. But I understand how you, the need for the aiming because the quality of the lasers are not that good. They don't come straight out, so you have to come up with this whole. Uh, yeah, I came up with that ball method. I don't know. Yeah, how yeah. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. But, okay, um, it was. What did I say? I was on 62. Yes. Okay, so we're going on to the, we're moving on to the next project, okay? Next project in okay. Bob's workshop. But let me just move this. You don't see what I'm moving, but I have all the crap laying around. Uh, let me see, did, did Len show up? I don't know if he did or he didn't. Yeah, Len's here. Len Felberg. Oh. Different Len. Different Len. Okay. Let's roll along here. This is called a tailstock crotch center. It's a, it's a machine shop thing. Uh, they plug in the tailstock. It has a V groove in it. You could put a round... Uh, round stock in it and just advance the tail stock and drill right through it. So this is a, an invention. A number of years ago, uh, I went to uh, Len Felberg, who's uh, one of our members that's a design engineer and has a lot of machine uh, shop stuff, lathes and stuff. And uh, he had one of these that he made but it was elongated, so you can take a uh, like a tool handle and drill a tool handle on the lathe right in the V-block, one, two, three, and he usually handheld it. And I was so impressed with it that I said, I got to have one of these. So I went and made one, and I made one out of oak, and I had a spare Morse taper uh, that I can't see it here, but it's uh, it's a screw chuck. So I drew lines center lines down, I put the screw chuck in, I plugged it in to um, my tail stock, took a right angle and uh, measured it. And uh, it was square. You should so then I put in, hello? Yeah. You should mention the reason for this is so that you drill directly, a round object directly on the center. Right. So what I did was I put this router bit in, it's a V router bit into the headstock and I drilled a hole and I had exactly where center is. Then I brought it over to the router table and uh, cut the groove and it worked great and I used it for a long time. Then I discovered something that pen mandrel has a five millimeter thread in it. So I popped one of these in, you know, it was good to go. And I made one out of aluminum exclusion, which is much better. I used the V slot in there. And here's a little video of that.
put my three moss taper back and thank you very much for that. Dennis, the videos you're taking, what are you using to take your videos with and are you, do you need to decrease the resolution to get them to play so nicely? I use my iPad. This is my first uh, shot at it. And this, these were my first shots at, uh, at doing any kind of editing. So these, this, is, um, this is the picture in action. Um, I had a video of it, so I needed some hands. So I used uh, this uh, pipe clamp, band clamp, to hold a, a three-quarter piece of uh, steel. I'm going to drill through that. And in a second, you can see that I could, I could turn the angle. It's very helpful. So here I'm just uh, advancing the tailstock. No big deal. This is soft steel, so there isn't a problem there. That's really clever. I like that. Yeah, well, the, the cool thing is that you, you want to make a tool handle and put some set screws in. This is one, two, three. You're done. So it's it's a great little tool. You don't have to go out to the drill press, get a get your V block vise and do all that other stuff and adjust it and then whatever. This is fast on center all the time. So uh, that was uh Len Felberg's uh kind of knockoff. So one day I had to chuck out and I had some uh V-box laying around this chuck, and all of a sudden, it hit me. I got a vision. I made myself able to take now round stock, small round stock, and drill holes on it in the lay that's already centered. It's the same concept as the tail stock, except I use this as a utility. So you can see that it has one, one, two, three screws in it. So I put a T-nut in and I held it. I put a T-nut here and held it. I put a T-nut here and held it. I put a T-nut here and held it. And the vise didn't move. Oh, yeah, well, I stopped the action of the vise. So I just opened this T-nut, opened this T-nut, and so it's uh, movable. And the vise just opens up and you put something in and you close it down. And you hold the item and lock the T-nuts in and you're ready to go. So that was another invention that I just found using these uh, V-slots, very little handy things. And that's how I did it. So you see, that's how I uh, photographed it. So now we're on, we're in an hour and 15. This is my uh, current, grinder slide. This is my new grinder that I just got uh, a few months ago and I had to make, uh, actually it's probably a year, and I had to make uh, jigs for it. So before I make the jigs, I just wanted to show you because it's confusing. Uh, this is also called a T-nut and these are 3816 T-nuts and I found a saw, cheap source for nylon uh, screws. So I just wanted to show this before I proceed. All right. This is my new grinder. And there seems to be a thing out there. Everybody has uh, dimensions to make, you know, to place your grinder on a block and whatever, all because you have to set your uh, jigs to a certain height. And uh, they don't have an adjustable height any of your jigs. And I was kind of tired of that. Um, and I see a lot of the members are running into problems because their grinder is either a little too high or a little too low, and it might make a difference, and it might not. It might be just me. But what I saw, that Jameson turned around and made something to raise up the um, a little doohickey that you put in there. I said, well, somebody else sees it. 
And then this guy in Geiger and Geiger Solutions, he made it. He made a, a slide that's uh, out of aluminum extrusions as well. And uh, hell, the hell with the crowd. So what I want to do is just show you how simple it is. All you have to do is have uh, you know your main block and then just open up, cut everything so that, in my case, my slide is 60 millimeters and um, everything is centered down in the wheels. And I have those T-nuts drilled in over here and over here. These are uh, these little knobs. I repurposed my, uh, my depth recorder knobs. So those came off my Lorance X15 that I had years ago. So I reused them. And this is kind of my setup. You have the slides. I have the adjustability up and down. And I have my own little jigs that over the years, it just evolved in my mind how I wanted to do it. This is probably my seventh or eighth grinder try. So this is Ellsworth on the left. And um, this is a batty-like thing that I made. So looking on this side, I have this weird thing. And this is a shaft collar. And this is another one of my ball bearings. It just, it rolled on the floor one day and I picked it up. I had no place to put it. And there's a shaft collar on the, on the workbench. I put it in there. I go, aha, that was a, an aha moment. So let me just show you how this is put together technically with um, the connections. So I have those joints there. I have one inside bracket holding the top and uh, have a little thing there for my Ellsworth. That's two inches for the Ellsworth. So I have some, uh, I put the motor shaft on and I have some T-nuts, I don't know, they're about 25 millimeters high and I just screw them in and it just kind of holds it there. Okay, my ball goes, that's a one inch ball bearing in a one inch, and that wasn't so expensive. When I'm sharpening, I like smooth, I like resistance. I don't like any resistance. I don't like that V thing that I used for years. And this is the belt sander that I constructed using aluminum extrusions. And uh, the platform is a quarter inch aluminum. Got some help with this from, uh, from Jeff. He milled this for me out. So this, if, if I were to use uh, wood shop tools, I would have just drilled a hole here and drilled a hole there and then take the jigsaw and then just cut that out and file it. But Jeff does a better job anyway. So the next slide is gonna be a reveal what's underneath. And you can see the construction is my 20 by 20s is kind of holding it all together. And I have a, an aluminum plate that has an arc in it that I routed and connected here. And on the other side, I have a, a swivel hinge on there, same on the other. Same on the other side, my mouth is starting to fade here. Hey, Dennis. So that's the, uh, yeah. I got a question about routing aluminum, right? So I, got, I actually have a project that I, I want to route some aluminum, and I was wondering how bad it beats up the router bits. I don't know. I'll give you my router bit in a minute. I'll show you. <laughs> okay. I, I just watched the machining video, and they did – it's like a four foot diameter steel uh, wheel. And he used a regular woodworking router bit and it did that whole thing. So well, here, here's the thing, Bob. Be too bad on it. Here's the thing, Bob. What's harder? How much harder, more harder is aluminum than, uh, you know, like it's maple? Hard car, rock well, you got carbide tip bits. Right, you got carbide tip bits going into aluminum. I, I just figured aluminum 
would uh, start wearing out the, the carbide? Well, you do, you should, you can spray a little oil on it to uh, WD cut the heat. Well, WD-40 is water-based, but yeah. Oh, but for the aluminum, that's supposed to work all right, pretty good. Yeah. Hey, so, Bob, they, anyway, Bob, Bob they machine uh, aluminum with carbide all the time. You just need a very sharp cutting edge. Okay, so, I got to try it. So anyway, the next slide shows, here's the T-notes, how it was connected, and what's this? Well, I wanted a 15-degree um, angle on that, so when it, I tilt it down, uh, it's really close to the belt. So I built a little uh, platform jig here, put it on, uh, screwed that on, and went and had a good time, went to my data on a table saw, uh, which is a eight inch Freud that I had for, I don't know how many years, before marriage, let's put it that way. And it just cut it fine. It just nibbled it off, no big deal. So the next video here is the carbide question. I took a Craftsman router, I took off the plate, and I put up back on my own uh, plate on there. You see the three screws are on there, and then I called the router bit up, and then I made, uh, I measured the pivot of the arc that I needed to make for that platform, and I uh, screwed it down on there, and then from this side, from the right to the left, don't go back. <laughs> you have to shut, when you finally make it through, you shut the router off. So that kind of looked like that. And that's how, and you can see the finish on there is pretty nice. You can see the mess, but this is Sears Craftsman, ah, 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 right? Does the job. Okay, now coming back, I had all kinds of problems getting the, uh, the platform to fit. The tradesman. It just, uh, I wanted to slide in my slide. I wanted it to be over, but, and I made this wider so I can reach over and have the arms. I just wanted it one platform and that's it. Now, tradesmen gave me beautiful platforms, but that too, they were too small. You know, it was like three by four, maybe. And I mean, that's okay, but I like the platform. I like, I don't want to think about the tool rocking downward when I'm sharpening. So anyway, I came up with the solution and I brought it up to where it was. From here to here, I made level. I brought up some blocks and decided, well, I have one arm going across and I'll hold it down and I have the other arm uh, in the slide. And you can see here that I utilized my two and a half by two and a half L's. I cut them for strength. And actually this one has a, uh, a thread going through. So you open the thread and, and this will slide in and out. And uh, this was quite challenging. It's quite messy looking, but it's very strong and that's what I'm happy about. So I have a thing with my grinder that I replaced. I won't show you the video, but I'll show you um, what was in uh, place. And this evolved. So I'm gonna go back to start from the beginning. And this was, I don't know, about three years ago. Um, Jeff sold me his belt sander for $50 and it had a belt sander and it had a grinder and I wanted to try out belt sanding for woodworking tools because I was pretty impressed with the pro edge, but there were a couple of things about it that I didn't like. So I wasn't going to buy a new tool, you know, another, yet another grinder. So I said, let me, let me see first if I can get the Tormac jigs working on this thing. And the grinder will not adjust to 90 degrees. It has three settings. You got to take it apart. This is at its 40 degree setting. So 
you can tell now how I started to use aluminum extrusions to its uh, fullest because I, you know, I didn't have measurements. I, you know, I was playing around here and there. So I attached the aluminum extrusion via a T nut to this little bracket, attached that to the wood. And uh, I have a wood block and I have a, uh, similar to this, a Tormac attachment. And I have the Tormac bar going across. And woe is me, because this thing isn't gonna work no matter how I do it. The platform and the knob is in the way. I can't face it the other way. I could only face it this way and I was upset and it didn't work for me. The other thing that didn't work was I had the grinding jig that, uh, it's used for the gouges and everything. Well, the gouge was hitting the motor. And I said, for order this to work, this has got to be vertical and I got to be able to do it higher and it won't hit. So I was kind of like upset and everything. But when you're upset, you know, you take things in your hand. So I picked this up. I picked this up. I started going inside and then, uh, I consolidated and I happened to put this in the hole and I go, oh my God, another aha moment. So I saw that I could use the aluminum uh, extrusion to, as a base for this Tormac thing and put on, you know, some T-nuts and I have myself my platform that I wanted. And you can see there it's 40 degrees and I was kind of into um, learning Batty then. So going back, this thing evolved because I wanted it at 90 degrees. I put it on a, a, a hinge and put that on a platform and I got it up to 90 degrees. And since that moves, this has to move. So I don't know, I was in lows and you see this little dovetail in there? Well, this thing came from a saw track and it's kind of coincidence that that T-nut that I showed you before fits right in there and slides all the way back and forth. So I went and I, I cut the saw track so that this would be able to move back and forth. I did the same thing for the motor because I didn't know where it, you know, where actually it was. And um, then I made a slide and I was in business and I used this for about two years two and a half years, just that my hands and fingers got tired of changing the belt. It was a very tough situation. Yeah, and this thing you see here is a second motor with some pulleys. Instead of using the motor here, which was uh, 3450 and makes this run about 5,500 feet per minute, with this, I brought it down to about 700 feet a minute, and I was able to uh, sharpen with it. And the other little thing you see here is, well, this is a protractor. I cut off the arms. You don't need that. those arms. They don't fit into gouges. You can't measure your gouge um, with long arms. You take that arm off and it, and it works. So you can see that I had the ball idea with one of these uh, you know, pieces of hardware and it just evolved better later on. And to the left here is uh, 8020. There was a sample kit that I used. So any questions on this? Dennis, just from a time check, how much, how much uh, longer? We're at an hour and a half now. Well, I mean, we could basically stop here. Um, I made a 40-40 sharpening jig. There's nothing, uh, I just run through this real quick that- uh, Dennis, I'm not saying we have to stop now. I'm just wondering how long, how much longer it is. We're almost done. Oh, okay. With this. Yep. It's the last of the last, sorry. Um, so, my friend Russ was studying with Stuart Batty. And uh, he was there and I sent him some pictures of this because I was struggling learning how to sharpen and I wanted to make a jig to sharpen it. And I did 
actually make the jig, but in the process of making the jig, I learned how to sharpen. So I ended up throwing out the jig and I sharpen uh, on the platform now. Um, basically, here's some ext extrusions. And then I have some slides because this is going this is going to slide in there and I'm going to slide back and forth to get the wings. And then the next thing was that this will pivot and stop at 40 degrees. So I stuck my gouge in, I did my sharpening, I went back and forth and then I came down and I rotated the tool up and it made a beautiful edge. And I was very happy and uh, Russ relayed to me that Batty said that it might work. So I was happy about that. I also tape, put a piece of tape on here and put the position that the flute has to be parallel on the top part here to go across. So anyway, that was kind of fun. And I dismembered all this. And that's it. You did good, Dennis. You lasted. It's neat stuff, Dennis, honestly. What? I said this neat stuff. I mean, you know, I can see that, you know, you see something that you need to do. You puzzle it, puzzle it, puzzle it. And you just hang in there and eventually you get it. And I understand that. I just love the aha moment when you have something that's not working and, you know, when I think of it in the shower or wherever else and all of a sudden, aha, that's what I'll do and it works. And I, I'm guessing that might be the joy for you in this stuff. Well, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of the angry developer. I was angry at, um, would turn as wonders because I had to return the CBN wheels to him three times. And it was really my grinder. But the truth of the matter is you don't put CBN wheels out there and sell them to wood turners um, that don't know anything about how CBN wheels have to be true. Otherwise they're wobbling out and you're wearing them out, you know, incorrectly. The CBN wheels, you can't true up CBN wheels, but you can true up a grinder. And, you know, that was one of the considerations in spending all that money with the tradesmen. Because the, grind, the, the belt sander for me worked great, except for the 10V. I had one 10V and it didn't work. I would come to your house and sneaky sharpen it on your CBN wheel. And I figured that, eh, maybe I want a CBN wheel and, and a belt sander. And the belt sander uh, was variable speed. So that helped me uh, a lot just uh, two, three weeks ago. I didn't realize it when I was trying to make a, uh, I was trying to make a, uh, whatchamacallit, um, a Cindy Drozda spindle gouge out of uh, one of my Robert Sorbys, and I was having a, you know, a tough time with it. And basically, it was eating up the metal too fast. I couldn't see the the shape forming. So when I took off the belt and I brought and I put on a a two twenty grit belt, a Triscat belt, in fact, I put it on, and then. I brought the speed all the way down. I can actually see the metal coming off. And I was actually able to guide it to get to the shape that I needed to get to. So the, the variable speed did help me in the tradesman. And, and the, um, the wheel is out maybe a thousand or two thousands of run out. You don't have that with any of the other wheels. You can't buy a cheap grinder and put a wheel on there and, you know, have that kind of uh, response. There's going to be some wobble. And Does anybody have any questions? I think we ought to wrap it up. Great. Dennis, I think you did a fantastic job. I mean, you've got a lot of 
brain power, not only in all the engineering that you did and the ideas that you did, but I, you certainly spent an enormous amount of time on this presentation and that's much appreciated. You really did an outstanding well, job. Thanks, you know, thanks for having me. I uh, kind of learned a lot, you know, pulling my hair out, but it was fun. And uh, we'll see you all. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Any, any, any questions for Dennis? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, Dennis. All right, talk to you soon, buddy. I will. Very good job. Outstanding work. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Thanks, Bob, for inviting us again. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you, Bob. See ya. All right. Have a good week, all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good right. evening. Bye. Get your umbrellas out for tomorrow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get the sump pumps going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hey, Russ, you want a follow-up call? You bet. I'll talk to you in a couple in a minute. Bob, thanks a lot. I'll I'll send you over a list if you yeah, want. Send, you yeah, want send, that picture from when yeah. I was laying on my back? Uh, Bob? Yeah. Oh, uh, which pictures would you like? Well, can you just send the whole presentation? I will try. Okay. So I, see if it's big. If we can uh, send that that much, but yeah, I, I think that's a really cool use of extrusions. Uh, and that now, now that it's fully explained, I do understand why you had had that. Uh, well, it's it's kind of the variability. I could have used an oak. Uh, horizontal bar and whatever, and drilled holes in that. As long right. as I had the, you know, the slots in the, ex, ex, have that trouble. The AEs, <laughs> aluminum ex, extrusions or the V slots. Um, the other thing is the the camera slides. Um, Jeff is gone, right? I'm sure. Jeff, oh, I'm Jeff sorry. is. Jeff will tell you what he did right. with. Dennis, Dennis had enough, uh, so he didn't want any pictures of. Uh, if you recall from the woodworking show, the Accu Slice. Yeah. Well, I used the same open build ex, uh, extrusions and uh, built. You uh, you put two rails, and now you have a carriage that you can slide in and out, and then uh, just push. Well, you use right. you use the wheels, right? Yeah, I use the I use the wheels, so it's rolling. Very nice. What do you use for the micro adjuster? Uh, I use the threaded rod and uh, and a nut. Uh, one of the digital digital calipers on it uh, attached to the piece. So as you you just use the three sixteenth uh, alt thread and tighten it in and out, and you can read your dimensions off. Mm -hmm. I have some pictures of it, but. Darn you, Dennis. I think I'm going to have to go buy some extrusions now. Open Build is a fascinating uh, website with all the, you know, it's geared towards like the 3D printers and that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, the wheels work nice. Uh, uh, you know, they have eccentric, so you can dial in how much eccentric they have and uh, probably get it. And really, there's. Yeah, Bob, this is almost this is no be good to make a, make a camera slide. You know, put a rail on it and uh, put a tripod mount mm -hmm. and just like roll it over the lathe. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, there's a bunch of guys that I've seen uh, make them on YouTube. So the wheel. The, thing, really the thing about the thing about uh, open builds is they were about half the price of eighty twenty at the time that I was looking at it. And eighty twenty. .net is another site that you should visit. They don't have the forums and the builds and the camaraderie that Open Builds has and the sharing thing. So they got that sharing thing going on like we have in the wood turning. Well, they got it in that. And there are so many uh, builds that are going on in that site that, you know, I gave that site to somebody and says, I got lost in there for like four hours, man. Would, would you give that to me? That was, you know, phenomenal site. And then, you know, they have the part store. So it's, it's kind of a great site. The prices yeah, did inch up a little bit. Yeah, the prices are up, I think, from when we first. Uh... Yeah, but, you know, I got a, like a 10% Father's Day uh, sale when I bought this stuff. So the price went down. 
And I'm, you know what? I'm surprised that nobody asked me how much did all this cost you. Well, I was wondering about that. Is this, it's so, I imagine it's sold by the foot, right? Well, I know the. I mean, the whole the whole project. Oh, the entire. Okay, yeah. What the whole project costs? The rails are sold. They have set lengths. You know, like two hundred and fifty millimeter, thousand millimeter. Uh, like well, I bought. I bought everything. I bought everything that I needed. Um, hardware, all the rails, the twelve. Uh, I think I bought twelve five hundred millimeter, and um, I bought some extra stuff. Uh, I bought a fifteen hundred, and I bought two thousands, and I bought a whole stuff, bunch of stuff, and it was like uh, a hundred and forty nine with the shipping. That's not bad. So I figure that all the other, the aluminum, the ball bearings, and all the other shit, I ran to two hundred, and I screwed up royally when <laughs> I bought those laser glasses that work too good. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm buying laser glasses to protect myself. Where's the laser? I can't see that it. It worked too good. That's funny. But actually, what I did was when I bought a, a potentiometer, you know, and acted as a dimmer to lower the voltage across, and I could bring the laser light all the way down. Oh, I forgot and to ask you that. Yeah. I also was that on a battery or that was AC power or what? That's uh an adapter that I repurposed. It was a five volt adapter for I don't know what. It was charging uh, earphones. But five volts is the maximum that you want to put in them. Oh, okay. All right. Well let's wrap it up, man. I think that was fantastic. Thanks for all that good work. Okay. All right, Good I'm gonna time. end the meeting. Wonderful. Right. Good night, okay. guys.